new Indian is in Moscow, the vibrant capital city of Russia. And we have the honor of having with us Ivan Timofeev, an economic analyst and a program director of the two most prestigious think tanks in Russia. One is Valdai Club and the other is Russian International Affairs Council. Welcome to Reason, the new Indian's platform where we get to the reason behind the issues that concern you. Welcome, Ivan. Thank you. So let me begin this conversation by recalling what has happened in the last few months. After Kremlin decided that it's going to send troops to Ukraine, the US and its allies have imposed massive, unprecedented sanctions on Russia. In fact, over 9,100 sanctions have been imposed by 46 countries. And the World Bank and the IMF have painted a doomsday scenario for Russia. They are predicting that Russian economy is going to collapse and it will set Russia back in time by 30 years. Is that a correct assessment? Well, uh, in fact, you are right in a sense that the amount of sanctions uh, against Russia has few precedents, in, at least in the recent past. Uh, Russia can be compared to Iran uh, in terms of the amount of restrictions. Though uh, the statistics which you mentioned uh, is very different from one source to another, and I would rather characterize it not in a quantitative terms, rather, but rather in a qualitative terms. Well, in fact, we are facing significant export control uh, restrictions, we, we are facing financial sanctions, transportation sanctions, etc. So all of this is serious and all of this is harmful. However, uh, this uh, has not led to the collapse of Russian economy. Uh, unlike the, uh, contrary to the expectations uh, which existed in February and uh, in March and later on. So now it's clear that uh, the economy turned to be much more adaptive than it had been expected. But has the Russian economy shrunk? Has the GDP growth come down? I remember that in February and in March there had been uh, very alarmist uh, assessments uh, stating that Russian economy will, will shrink, uh, will lose 25 percent, something like that. Then there was a World Bank scenario indicating 8.9 percent. Now the assessment of the Russian government, which is quite robust, I would say, uh, is around 4 percent. I would say that this assessment uh, seems to be real because Russian economy uh, f enjoys uh, quite high prices of uh, oil and gas due to the overall geopolitical um, uncertainty. Uh, Russian central bank and minister of finance managed to control the financial system and now um, take into control the inflation. Uh, and business tend to be much uh, quicker in terms of adaptation uh, to sanctions uh, finding new supplies, uh, finding new markets abroad, uh, including the Russian oil, the Russian coal, uh, and including the imports to Russia of a number of uh, important items. The US and allies froze Russia's nearly half of financial reserves. And they also expelled the largest Russian banks from the SWIFT payment system. How did Russia deal with this crisis? What are the alternatives that Russia has formulated which helped Russia deal with this? As for the reserves, true that we uh, lost uh, quite a huge sum of money, uh, more than uh, $300 billion. And uh, let's be realistic, uh, there are a few chances that uh, we will have uh, an access to this money in the foreseeable future. Uh, this is painful, but this is not critical for, for the economy. Of course, we could use this money uh, for the country. Now we cannot. And this is, this is bad, but this is not catastrophic. Right? Uh, by the way, one other uh, part of this issue is that uh, a number of Russian 
property assets abroad may be confiscated in the nearest future due to new legislation. A piece of this legislation is already adopted in Canada. European Union may do the same, United States may do the same. So uh, these uh, losses in terms of national reserves uh, may be uh, complemented by the losses of uh, some pieces of property. But again, this won't be critical for the economy in general. Uh, this would, by the way, harm the trust to the Western financial system in terms of uh, keeping the reserves. So other countries uh, like uh, Saudi Arabia or Turkey or India or, or China may think twice before keeping reserves in, 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 the, in the banks where they can so be So you're saying that actually this is an alarm for the rest of the world this is and, and countries might actually now decrease their own dollar reserves? Th th they may do it uh, gradually. They will not do it uh, abruptly and they will not take uh, uh, radical decisions. But this is something they would definitely keep in mind, that something wrong may happen with their reserves if they have uh, uh, towering contradictions with uh, the United States or the West. And um, the second part of your question is about SWIFT. Well, the uh, not just SWIFT, but also blocking sanctions against major Russian banks uh, complicated their life, of course. Uh, they halted their, many of their international transactions and, of course, it damaged a lot uh, their uh, uh, major Russian financial institutions. However, in terms of financial stability of Russian Federation, this was not a major factor. So the central bank managed to keep financial stability because Prior to February 2022, 20, uh, quite a huge deal uh, had been done uh, to uh, make the Russian financial system sovereign, right? So we have our own payment system, uh, we have our own system of uh, banking communication, which is much smaller than SWIFT, uh, but, but we have one, right? So this allowed to diminish this, uh, this damage. And what is more important, not all of banks are uh, expelled from uh, from SWIFT. There are a number of Russian banks which are still using it, which makes possible to continue foreign transactions like with, with foreign countries like India, China, uh, Turkey, uh, Latin American countries, and even European one, and even the United States, beyond this uh, sanctions so restrictions. So explain it to our audience that why are some of the largest banks still using SWIFT payment system in Russia? Smaller banks, which are not covered by these sanctions, they may use it, right? So big banks, which are covered by these this sanctions, they cannot. They, uh, they have to diversify their businesses to make more stress on the internal market. However, there are many other, there, there, are, there are other smaller banks which are not covered by the sanctions. Okay, smaller banks. Which may be covered in the future, but they are... Uh, As of today, they are not. Yeah, uh, uh, up to date, they are not, right? So it's possible to continue uh, transactions, including dollar transactions, if these transactions are not covering the sanctioned persons. How has Russia filled the gap created by the losses caused by the embargo on Russian oil and gas by Europe? What is the mechanism with which Russia is compensating for the losses? In fact, uh, the United States uh, has completely prohibited all Russian uh, energy uh, uh, on its market, including uh, oil, gas, coal, uh, and all other possible uh, uh, sources of uh, carbon sources of energy, right? So for Russia, it accounted for around 10% of, uh, of its supplies. Great Britain is going to do the same by the end of the year. Uh, European Union is doing the same by the end of this year in terms of oil and in terms of oil products uh, by February 5 of next year. So uh, what Russia does uh, is the redirection of these volumes to other markets. Asian markets are of top priority, so India has increased significantly the amount of Russian oil in its balance. Uh, China is doing the same. So uh, for them, Russian oil is becoming very attractive because Russia is uh, selling it with discounts. Uh, and of course, it's much more profitable but, but for the economy. China, China and India put together, Will they compensate for the amount of oil and gas that Europe was buying from Russia? In the short run, uh, rather no than yes. 
However, these losses by uh, uh, th these losses of revenues will be compensated by the price. The price is now higher than it uh, used to be. So, what do you anticipate? You think this high price will prevail for a very long time? Uh, hard to say. It's uh, it's pretty hard to forecast this market dynamics. Uh, I would be more cautious in this regard, and I would assume that the price at some point will go down, and. At least <coughs> our government is uh, keeping this bad scenario. What will that depend on when the price goes down? It depends on the volume of oil uh, in the international market. It, it depends on, on other sources like renewables and the level of their uh, uh, consumption. Uh, it also depends on the economic growth uh, so do and you the, think the demand on oil. Do you think that there uh, is enough growth in renewables in Europe no. and the US, no. Australia no. and no. other no. developed no. No. countries? No. Definitely no. Definitely no. Uh, but by now it's, uh, it's not enough. Moreover, the, the economies in the West will need uh, more energy to recover their uh, economies. So this may mean that the price uh, may remain quite high. Though there are attempts by, by the United States and by the G7 to limit the price of the Russian oil, the so-called oil cap. So they want to uh, deny the, the, uh, the supply of the transportation of the seaborne uh, uh, Russian oil if the contract is higher than $50. But this is an artificial thing, right? I'm afraid that this would uh, lead to the further increase of prices. It may deteriorate the markets. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, Russia may use it uh, to, to conduct damping in the market. So if you sell your oil uh, at $50, for instance, and others sell it at 100, guess who, whose oil would be more attractive? Yes. Of course, ours, right? So we may compensate these losses by the, by the volume uh, in this case, right? So, but the comp competitiveness of the Russian oil uh, would increase. So tell me, what if uh, the Gulf countries, uh, the Arab world and other oil and gas producing countries increase the volume of oil and gas? What happens in that scenario? Well, by now... Uh, uh, because as you remember, President yeah, Joe Biden yeah, has been yeah. asking Saudi Arabia to yeah. increase the volume. Well, by now they seem to be quite reluctant to this idea because uh, this would harm their revenues, right? And they are not going to do this. So uh, they, they prefer to, uh, to control the volume, uh, not to deteriorate the market, not, not to lose uh, profits. But uh, tell me that uh, if this continues, this war continues, and everybody has been saying that the winter in Europe is going to be very, very difficult because uh, they were dependent on Russian oil and gas and uh, with scarcity, of oil and gas, it's going to be very difficult in Europe. Is that scenario really realistic? Because Ursula von der Leyen has come up with a program which uh, in fact is going to uh, somehow help the poor to have oil and gas even in winters. Well, winter will be complicated uh, for Europe uh, and for Ukraine. Uh, however, in case of European Union, uh, despite the losses, despite the decline of the compatibility of the economy due to the lack of uh, supplies, possible lack of supplies, uh, they may be able to survive, to uh, overcome this crisis uh, by different means. Uh, they are increasingly buying uh, gas from other supplies, they are increasingly uh, recovering the um, uh, generation uh, connected to coal, right? Uh, so uh, France, for instance, is uh, totally, uh, well, m m to a high extent independent and relies on nuclear energy, right? So uh, the damage uh, uh, will be uh, not the same uh, if you compare different countries uh, of, of Europe. So Germany will suffer more than France, for instance. Uh, so I, I believe that Europe will have to uh, bear significant losses, but uh, they, they will adjust at the end. Let's be realistic. So when you say uh, they will adjust, does that mean that people will suffer and they will bear the pain? Or does it mean that the governments 
in Europe will figure out a plan. They have already figured out a plan. They, they already have it uh, and they're implementing it. Uh, people will suffer definitely. Uh, but what is more important, industries will suffer. And people will, uh, uh, will uh, suffer not just due to the decline of temperature in their houses, uh, but due to the uh, decline of the, of the economy and possible uh, decline of the amount of uh, job places, of the uh, long-run compatibility of the uh, economy, competitiveness of the economy. Uh, so um, uh, the macro effect may, will, will be significant, but again, uh, it will not be uh, fatal for European economy. It will lose a lot, but uh, it but will But clearly adopt. it will lose way more than Russia is losing. Russia uh, will also have to uh, take losses. We are losing a uh, big market uh, in Europe. Uh, big market of oil is already lost. Big market of coal is already lost. So market of gas is about to be lost, right? Uh, however, uh, in one way or another, this uh, loss uh, uh, is inevitable at some point. So uh, probably the, the opinion here in Moscow is that it's better to do it now than to uh, prolong this uh, process. But what I don't understand is that if Europe is going to suffer more losses, why are they doing this? Why are they becoming a party uh, into the sanctions that are essentially imposed by the US? Due to the political reasons. Uh, so uh, the, the problem with the analysis of, of the current situation is that quite often uh, scientists and scholars like myself, we are, we are taking the situation in a two, two rational terms, right? So we think that if uh, something is bringing losses, then it shouldn't happen. But the life is much more complicated. Quite often, political decisions are uh, being made uh, despite the losses, right? So, as we say, politics merge the economy. Politics it's, is not always rational. Uh, well, not, not always Russia, right? So, it, it can just, uh, let's say, subdue economy, right? Subject it to, 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 to the political, uh, to the political uh, aims. Explain for our audience that how is it that over 1,200 foreign um, brands have either suspended or terminated their operations in Russia. And yet, it doesn't seem to have really affected Russia. What is really replacing brands like Apple, uh, IKEA, Visa, Masterclass? Who is replacing these brands in Russia? Well, uh, I wouldn't say that this is uh, a major problem for the Russian economy, though many consumers uh, has got used to these brands and uh, they, they like it, they appreciate their presence, etc. But in terms of macroeconomy and the economy in general, this is not a major problem. One of the issues is that we have lost investments of these companies, right? But on the other hand, uh, the experience of the recent uh, several months shows that uh, they are quickly replaced by other players from China, from Turkey, uh, from other countries, even from Iran, right? And by Russian producers themselves. In, num in a number of cases, these companies which are living, they are selling their businesses to the management, right? Uh, with the hope to get back at some point. Uh, at some, uh, uh, in some cases, uh, other producers are coming, for instance, in the area of fast food, uh, Turkish uh, business is uh, very active. In terms of car building, Chinese are, c are coming uh, quite actively. So, uh, I I at the end, uh, these companies are losing a huge Russian market, which is really big. Right, and it's not uh, clear would they be able to get back if the political uh, dust settles down at some point. But the same logic applies to them too, as you pointed out earlier. That yes, you may have lost a uh, market in Europe, but that but then you are gaining markets elsewhere. They could also use the same argument, saying that, okay, Russia is one market, but we are gaining elsewhere. In terms of business, they already have markets in India, in Turkey, in China. And if they leave the Russian market, 
for instance, the Chinese market will not get bigger. So the abundance from, the, from Russia will not, uh, would not mean the increase of their revenues in other countries, right? So for them, uh, this means losses. Uh, uh, this means losses. But uh, many of them prefer to leave uh, uh, partly because of the, uh, of the political pressure and partly due to the pressure of the media with the so-called special investigations, how you are still working in Russia, you are supporting the Russian government uh, indirectly. So, uh, well, it's a shaming game, right? A, a kind of a bullying. Uh, so uh, many companies are afraid of this. They prefer to have losses, uh, but not, not, not to have even bigger losses due to this uh, shaming and bullying. Uh, in their own countries. Russian car production at home dropped by a stunning 61.8%. And the automobile industry in Russia is hugely dependent on imports from Europe. Are Russians still buying European cars? If yes, why and how come? Russians are still buying. Uh, because uh, not all, all of the cars are prohibited. Uh, so according to the uh, EU uh, regulation number 833, uh, uh, the luxury cars are prohibited from supplying to, to, to Russia, which cost is higher than $50,000. Uh, Some companies uh, has, uh, ha have halted their supplies voluntarily, Right, but not 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 because they are forced by legal mechanism, but no one prohibits uh, the supply of these cars via via the third countries, for instance, via Kazakhstan or uh, via uh, other jurisdictions. So so European cars uh, will appear in in Russia, but their uh, compat compatibility on this uh, market will be lower in comparison with Chinese cars, for instance. Now we, we anticipate the boom of the Chinese producers who, are, who, who will have much uh, more favorable uh, conditions. And one, uh, one other thing, uh, Russians now are uh, investing a lot uh, into the production of uh, electro cars. And uh, we have our own technologies and we have also supplies of uh, such cars and assembly lines from China. Right, so uh, in this sense, these sanctions paradoxically may uh, uh, bolster the transition of uh, Russia to electricity in terms of uh, car industry, uh, automobiles, uh, in comparison with, with the situation when sanctions uh, had not been in place. What I understood from everything that you have said so far is two things. One. Uh, on the oil and gas front, it's the America who is really benefiting from this war. And on the automobile side, it's actually China which is benefiting. So are we saying that this conflict in Ukraine is actually helping the two biggest superpowers, which were already pretty superpower, powerful, and uh, it's Ukraine, it's Europe, and it's Russia who are really getting affected by Let's start with the United States. Um, I believe that you, you, the United States are gaining in the sense that uh, European competitors are becoming weaker in comparison with American producers. Uh, however, uh, in terms of uh, oil prices, they are rather losing than uh, winning because uh, high oil, oil prices accelerate the, inflations in the inflation in the United States and this is not a piece of cake for the current administration in terms of uh, the uh, elections looming on the horizon. As for China, well China is uh, generally uh, gaining from this situation because now the United States has to be more concentrated on containment of Russia uh, and China is considered uh, to be a much more dangerous uh, opponent for the United States uh, uh, than, uh, Russia. Than, than Russia, right. So now Russia uh, is getting more closer to China. Uh, their partnership is uh, gaining more energy. 
uh, and uh, the United States uh, has to conduct the so-called dual containment of both Russia and China at the same time. But at the same time, uh, what you're really saying is China is becoming stronger. China is becoming stronger, definitely. I believe that China is a major uh, winner in this situation, right? Uh, not the United States. Uh, I, I would uh, name China and uh, Turkey by the way. Turkey? Yeah, Turkey. Explain how. Well, because Turkey uh, has not joined uh, sanctions regimes uh, against Russia. Uh, Turkey is substituting uh, a lot of, uh, well, a number of uh, items on the Russian market. So they are gaining a lot in terms of economy. They are performing as a transportation hub when Europe is closed for Russian jets. They are opening their uh, country for more Russian tourists, etc. So in terms of economy, they have gained a lot. They have a significant gain. And politically speaking, too, they are trying uh, to, to maintain good relations with Russia. But at the same time, they are providing a lot of arms to the Ukraine. They are still a member of NATO. Uh, and uh, they are a part of the Euro-Atlantic security community. So they are managing to sit at several chairs at the same time quite successfully. So in a nutshell, what is the United States really doing? I mean, who is the United States empowering at the end of the day? Well, the, 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 the United States are <coughs> empowered by many factors. Uh, first of all, they are empowered, empowered by their leadership in international finance by uh, their still remaining leadership in a number of technological areas, by their leadership in the military alliance, uh, alliances in, in Europe and uh, in Asia. So uh, we should not underestimate the uh, capabilities of the United States. I agree with, with many Russian observers who, <coughs> and international observers who state that the relative capabilities of the United States are declining, they are tending to decline. But it's too early to uh, state that uh, the U.S. Uh, is collapsing. So it is still quite strong. It is still a superpower. Uh, and we have to deal with it. Let me bring you back to what you said at the outset of this conversation. That other countries will now think twice about having massive yeah. dollar reserves. And that brings me to the point of de-dollarization. That's a concept that everybody is now talking across the world. Is de-dollarization on the anvil? It's really, is it happening? Are other countries now pushing their own currencies? For example, India does want to, uh, you know, uh, do trade with Russia mm -hmm. in rupees. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there already is trade happening in Yuan. Yeah. Yeah. So what exactly is happening to the dollar? Well, Russia now is a champion of de dollarization due to obvious reasons, due to sanctions. We, we have no other choice, right? Uh, in some cases, de dollarization uh, works better than in others. When our trade uh, is about the, uh, the deals with developed markets like China uh, and India, for instance, then uh, the trade in yuan or in rupees makes sense. Because uh, if we get yuans or if we get rupees, we, the, the markets of China and India is quite big and we can spend this, uh, this money quite successfully, right? Uh, but when it comes to a smaller market, a smaller country, or to the trade with uh, much more narrow scope of, uh, of goods and services, then it, it, uh, it, it can make problems, right? So it will be harder to... Uh, spend the currencies of uh, country X, uh, Y or Z, right? Uh, especially if, if these are small countries. By now, dollar is still quite, a, uh, quite an attractive uh, mean of international payment due to the simple fact that dollars can be uh, spent everywhere. Uh, so uh, you can sell something, get dollars and spend them at other place. However, uh, taking into account the overall uh, politicization of, uh, of, of the dollar, at some point we will find another currency or currencies which would be more attractive for, for the investors. I believe that Yuan is uh, candidate number one uh, due to the fact that Chinese market is very diversified, Chinese economy is uh, quite huge and China itself uh, uh, may make further steps to uh, make Yuan more uh, convertible and in this way attractive to the uh, international investors. But we'll see. Lots, lots would depend on the, this uh, 
uh, currency policy of Chinese government. One last question. Tell me, what do you foresee about Russian economy as well as global economy in next six months? The global economy will uh, continue to grow up. Uh, and uh, it will continue uh, to recover after COVID-19, though uh, it will face uh, a number of major problems, uh, including the inflation. Inflation is not something caused just by the conflict in Ukraine, but rather by a more fundamental increase of, uh, the, um, of the cash mass uh, connected to COVID-19, right? Uh, uh, there would be the leaders of, of the growth. Uh, I would uh, point, out, point out India and China in this uh, line. Uh, Europeans and Americans will uh, grow up moderately and uh, European growth will be blocked by the factors which uh, we had mentioned. mentioned. In the Russian case, uh, we will have losses, but much less than ha we had anticipated. And maybe next year we will even have some uh, slight growth. Well, on that positive note, let me wrap up this excellent, enlightening conversation with you. I hope our audience learns a lot from your economic and financial expertise. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much. Thank you.